Hi, uh, this is George Ruby from the uh, studio at the Collaborative Center for Literacy Development in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, broadcasting from the University of Kentucky. And we're going to do a PowerPoint recreation um, from the Literacy Research Association uh, session this year, and I'll explain in a second. Well, hello, I'm George Ruby, Associate Research Professor of Literacy Education at the University of Kentucky and Director of the Collaborative Center for Literacy Development for the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I'm here to recreate my introduction to a Thursday afternoon session at the Literacy Research Association Annual Meeting on Marco Island, Florida, December 4th, 2014. Uh, the uh, title of which was Clip Text, Fractionated Conceptions of Text and Textuality. It was an exciting session with a great lineup of scholars to address a long-standing topic of debate, operational definitions of instructional text. But like any good English teacher, I must remind you that topic and theme are not the same thing. And the theme for the session was handling the trade-offs necessary when constructing operational definitions for research, practice, or policy. This was a Pecha Kucha session. That meant each presenter got 20 slides, free time for 20 seconds each, total of 6 minutes and 40 seconds, a very tight time frame. One meant to force focus by restricting meta discourse and tangential digression. Aha! A trade off between scope and precision. See the theme? Videos for these presenters, some filmed live at the session, are available at the LRA YouTube thread, and I strongly encourage you to check them out. Dave Pearson, Freddie Hebert, Anne McGill Franzen, Frank Serafini, Greg McVeary, Ian O'Byrne, Margaret Haygood, Ronnie Cho Draper, and Kelly Chandler Olcott. I mean, is that an incredible lineup or what? It's fabulous. We had a range of theoretical frames in the session, cognitive, sociocultural, techno-modernist, developmental, range of student populations, early reading people, children's literature people, content area people, adolescent literacies people, new literacies people. We had a balance of men and women and a selection across career stage, preeminent scholars, mid-career researchers and theorists, early career academics. On the other hand, our panel lacked racial and linguistic diversity. We had invited several scholars of color whose work spoke well to the session theme, but none were available to attend LRA, and by the time we worked through our short list, it was three hours to deadline. Lesson learned, start inviting your session participants more than three days before the proposal is due. I apologize for that. Again, our topic is instructional text, our theme, the challenge of trade-offs. Every presenter was asked to address four questions. First, what is your definition of instructional text? Secondly, what does that definition emphasize or accomplish in practice or research? Three, what does the definition leave out that may also be of importance? And four, how do you deal with what gets neglected or does it matter? Let me outline the issues we had in mind when uh, Ian, Greg, and I put this session together. Every definition of text implies a definition of literacy and vice versa. Every theory of reading development implies a model of reading instruction with implications for using specialized text in developmentally and instructionally effective ways. But there are trade-offs to those choices. Resources devoted to particular aspects of reading instruction are not available to devote to other aspects, forcing us to face instructional opportunity costs. If we choose to emphasize the rudiments of the graphophonemic code, for instance, we might argue for decodable texts. But if we do, we may wind up de-emphasizing the teaching of syntactic and semantic pattern prediction and other elements of text-related language comprehension. If we attempt to legislate the acceleration of human development on behalf of constrained skills for decoding, assuming that's possible, we may outrun kids' verbal working memory for meaning-making. Another issue is text leveling. Recently, there's been some argument for using frustration-level text to advance reading ability. But with kindergarten, now the new first grade, how much more frustrating can things get? If we construct texts that emphasize orthographic regularities, we fail to address the irregularities that abound in English. If we place outlines and glossaries at the front of textbook chapters to facilitate students' reading comprehension, how do we develop students' autonomous vocabulary inferencing and text structure modeling skills? Forced choices are often false choices, though, and the result can be junk either way. The goal should be the best of all possible effects, even at the expense of statistical reliability. Oh, crap, another trade-off. Hmm. Well, anyway, still having made a choice on such matters, how do you address the needs of teachers who face a more diverse range of developmental trajectories and instructional requirements than a pre-designed text set allows for? Impose text, preclude options. Then there's the issue of instructional versus authentic text. Authenticity, as argued by scholars, seems a very different thing than authenticity as experienced by students, for whom real text or genres they can recognize as inviting, welcoming them into particular discourse communities to which they actually wish to belong. Otherwise, the text is as uninteresting as any other text teachers make them read. Jerry Harsty has said curriculum is a metaphor for the people we want to be, where do we accomplish the necessary student tie-in between text and self for long-range literacy development on behalf of a literate identity and a more literate society? 
let alone college and career readiness. Speaking of metaphors, our theories and the scales of analysis at which they are formulated and debated present another set of trade-offs, one about which we are generally oblivious, yet we can't seem to get our warrants to cohere without them. Metaphors. As Lakoff and Johnson, before them Stephen Pepper, noted, our theories are metaphors for our assumptions about causation and as such operate at the most pervasive yet unobvious level of our thinking about instructional phenomena. Yet for purposes of research or practice, theory needs to be operationalized. Uh, through disciplinary processes, the metaphors take form, they get concretized and finally reified, whereupon their use seems intuitive, yet difficult to transfer across context or pragmatic schism. The more comprehensive in scope a theory is, the less precise. The more precise, the less broadly applicable. But theoretical uh, arguments across scales of analyses are category errors, and therefore inadequate as critiques of how the nature of causation is framed in other views. Speaking of which, our research journals and handbooks are instructional texts too, written and laid out in a way that notoriously glazes the eyes of the uninitiated, but that allows the cognoscenti to negotiate the content in an expeditious and effective way. Doctoral programs offer seminars for developing the reading and writing skills necessary to make use of these kinds of texts. Our professional journals do much the same, reiterating for enrichment purposes the idioms, memes, and touchstones du jour favored by the professional organization's leadership so that teachers can become uh, familiar with these forms of parlance. Finally, and I'll end on this, conference sessions such as this are a kind of instructional text, structured in peculiar ways for valued purposes. One of our proposal reviewers asked whether the Pekka format was the best approach for a session on this topic. And the truth of the matter is, I don't know. I think the answer is yes, though, and we'll find out. Remember, the idea here is to enjoy abbreviated position statements from each of these scholars. It's up to you, the audience, to make the comparisons and contrasts between positions to act, in essence, as a collective discussant. Please do be verbal and enjoy the show. And may I end by thanking all of you for attending to these short form balancing acts, such as the one you have just seen me perform. This is George Ruby at the Collaborative Center for Literacy Development, University of Kentucky, thanking you very muchly.